Let's talk supply chain. So welcome to the show, Nitin. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Happy to be here. Let's talk supply chain. Yes, I can't wait. I'm so excited to have have you here. I mean, when I was doing my research for the show, I was getting really excited about you as an entrepreneur and also about the impact that Pando is having on the industry. I mean, there's so much to talk about. So let's just dive right in. When I have guests on the show, I don't always get to interview the founder. But when I do, I love to dig into their background and discover the journey that sort of led to where you are today. So share your founder story with us. I know this isn't the first company that you founded and you were named a Forbes India 30 under 30. So take us on that journey and how you came to found Pando. Yeah, totally. Um, hey, thanks for having me here. But before before I dive into my, my story, um, I truly believe that Pando before anything else is a platform for uh, supply chain professionals and operations professionals globally as a community to come together, learn together, and grow together and have fun together. So I'm stoked to be here and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Um, so my story, I was born and bred in Chennai in the south of India, which is now a growing software as a service hub uh, where phenomenal yeah. startups that grew to be global leaders like uh, Zoho and Freshworks and Chargebee and others were from. Um, I've lived, studied, and worked across Singapore, New York, and London. In India, we grew up seeing technology sort of evolve and crack through old, uh, sort of established industries like, you know, agriculture, mobility, manufacturing, supply chain, and so on, right? So while at grad school in the UK, I was a research scholar focusing on how driverless technology uh, would impact freight goods and mobility. Right. And we got to work with and, you know, got the opportunity to work closely with a bunch of Fortune 500 companies, Philips, Unilever, Procter & Gamble and so on, advising on how technology could help uh, scale their supply chains and how driverless vehicles would would impact their supply chains. Right. So right out of grad school, I took those learnings to start my first startup. It was called iDelivery with two co-founders, and uh, we essentially set out to build a marketplace for domestic freight, right? Okay. Um, Uber for freight was a popular phrase back then, and that's how we positioned ourselves. And over the course of the next year and a half, we got to spend time and sell to a bunch of Fortune 500 customers to whom we pitched a technology-enabled 3PL, or third-party logistics service. Oh. Along the way, something interesting started happening. Our customers would treat our ability, ability to deliver products, essentially us being a 3PL, as a commodity, but would get very excited by the tech that, that we had. We started okay. getting feature requests. We started getting suggestions from customers. And our users were very excited about what, what you know, they were seeing, right? Uh, and so somewhere along the way, I think, uh, you know, customers started asking us if uh, we could expand our tech into other freight and warehousing providers. But obviously there was a conflict there. We were yeah. one of the carriers to these customers and, you know, and, and therefore there was, there was um, you know, this, this conflict there. Actually, this happens even today. Flexport yeah. or CH Robinson, for example. They have phenomenal user experiences and de technology products, analytics products, which companies can avail of when they use Flexport as their freight partner. Right? Right. But that tech is not available and does not extend to all of their supply chains globally, for instance. right? So yeah. we pivoted iDelivery into Pando with the same team and the same investors and so on from being a technology-enabled 3PL into being a pure software company, a product business with a focus on building world-class tech to help companies get end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and optimization across their global logistics. And here we are. It's been three and a half years. What a story. I mean, this is the reason why we ask for the founder story. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize when you haven't been a founder or an entrepreneur how the journey is never a straight line and how you're always zigzagging, you're always pivoting, you're always coming up with new ideas out of conversations that you're having with potential customers, with customers, with industry experts and things like that. And you have to be agile enough to pivot. And that is such an amazing story. And I'm so glad that you shared that with us. So talk to us about exactly what you do at Pando. How do you help your customers? 
Absolutely. Um, you know, just one quick point on, on pivots, right? Uh, yeah. I sort of think about that as, uh, as an evolution than, a, than, than, you know, a zigzag, if you would. Okay. Uh, Sarah. And I think the, the, the important piece uh, for us, and it's the culture at Pando, is to really keep your ear to what the users and customers want and need. Right. Uh, and oftentimes different people say different things. Uh, but uh, if you keep your ears to what the ultimate user, the ultimate customer yeah. needs, I think that sort of becomes your North Star in terms of what, what you're here to do. Let's take one such customer, Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson that Pando today serves right? and talk about what Pando does for these customers. So these businesses have dozens of technology applications, or let's call them business systems, to run their supply chains globally, right? Transport yeah. management systems, warehouse management systems, order management systems, inventory management systems, manufacturing planning systems, visibility solutions, Ooh. warehouse robotics, procurement tools, et cetera, right? There are dozens of these that these companies use. Most of these solutions were actually built before the year 2000. Right. If you take the Gartner, okay. Gartner quadrants for TMS or WMS, et cetera, and you take the players there, 100% of them were actually built before the year 2000. Let's just take a minute to understand what that means, right? That's a long time ago. This like tech that- 22 years ago. A exactly. Lot of exactly. <laughs> this was tech that was built when e-commerce did not exist, when right. mobile and cloud were pretty much non-existent when omni-channel as a word did not even exist. Forget, <laughs> forget as a concept being used, right? So this was a long, long time back, right? And, uh, you know, some of us at Pando were in diapers when uh, this tech was built. And all Don't the engineers <laughs> and, and all the engineers who built this tech have either retired or, God forbid, died. Uh, and so really just the, the, the uh, tech that sort of sustains global supply chains is completely archaic, right? Um, and so not only are these systems not ready to face 2022, but the biggest and probably the most pressing problems that our customers face is that these systems don't talk very well with each other, right? Uh -huh. So a DC manager in Atlanta for Procter & Gamble has to use four, ten, sometimes up to 10 different solutions with wow. different user experiences and different backend databases and log in. right to log in and move data from here to there to there to there in the process of shipping one biscuit that you ordered or right. you know a pack of chips that he needs to deliver and so on right and so these broken systems ultimately um, you know break the overall experience on one hand but also think about what that means for the business right end to end supply chain visibility from their suppliers to their own facilities, which is their factories and warehouses, to their customers across different SKUs and different carriers and different warehouses, across transportation, warehousing, inventory, and order management. That's the panacea, right? That's what companies need and want, but it's close to impossible to get because these systems are siloed and don't talk very well with each yeah. other, right? Mm -hmm. So that's essentially what Pando builds and is, is solving for uh, Sarah, a single pane of glass. Now, you know, engineers at Pando call that a SPOG, uh, but a single pane of glass that essentially cuts across transportation, warehousing, inventory, and order management, that cuts across your suppliers, your facilities, and your customers, essentially give you end-to-end -end visibility and optimization for your supply chain. That's essentially what we do. Well, and, and what you're talking about really is inefficiencies. Yeah. I mean, every single... Um, Part of that journey that you took us on as a DC manager in Atlanta, as an example, really cuts into the inefficiencies of what somebody has to go through in order to do their job on a day to day basis. And that's not really what you're paying them for. Yeah. Is to yeah, manage totally. those systems and figure out those systems and go in and out and move data. Yeah. Right. And so, how do we get people back to what they really need to be? Uh, focusing on and what they're doing for the company. So let's talk about some of those challenges, right? That you're helping to address for your customers. I think your platform, while primarily meant for shippers, extends across suppliers, carriers, freight forwarders, and distributors, which you just mentioned. 
Um, and all of them have individual challenges, right? Set within the larger landscape of the industry and supply chain can be very, very complex. So what are the most significant issues you're seeing right now? And what are you trying to solve by bringing all of them together, all of them plus the different solutions just together in one platform. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I love um, how one particular customer of ours, uh, Danaher, put this, right? At the peak of the pandemic, um, a year and a half back, uh, when in the second wave, um, we get a call from Danaher saying, we have more customer orders than ever before, right? Our right. customers, the demand is through the roof. We have inventory that we have manufactured and ready to be shipped out, but that conversion from available inventory to servicing our customers is not happening fast enough because we're using too many solutions across this. And so to your point, what does this mean? Of course, we're solving for that DC manager in Atlanta, but really we're solving for you and for me, Sarah. These are products and brands that we love and live with. The clothes that we wear, the shoes that we wear, the food that we eat, the table I'm sitting on, the laptop I'm talking to you on, right? These brands ultimately serve you and me. And so the mission for Pando, what you know, we set out to do, of course, is to solve supply chain issues and logistics inefficiencies, as, you're, as you call them out, but really is to serve the brands that we love to help those brands serve us better. Us better. And so, yes. right, it's it's a really personal, very selfish mission. It is so that our, the brands that I love can serve me better and the brands that you love <laughs> can serve you better, right? So I, I just I wanted to, that. yeah, and uh, that's that's really what, what we're trying to do. So coming back, right, there is, you know, people talk about supply chain issues in, in abstracts, right? But when you really come down to the brass tacks of this, there is a massive data problem in supply chains that no one talks about. Okay. Supply chains ultimately are about five sets of data, right? And let's call this network data, right? This five sets of data are data about your customers, data about your suppliers, right? Data about your facilities, your factories and your warehouses, your facilities, data about your carriers or your transporters that are moving things around and data about your products or SKUs, as companies would call them, right? Five things, customers, suppliers, SKUs, carriers, and your own facilities. These five things yeah. ultimately bring everything together, right? Now, we spoke about how there are these, you know, hundreds of systems, dozens of systems that companies need to use, uh, and how these systems in turn don't talk very well with each other. If you dig under the hood of a TMS, a transport management system, or a warehouse management system that a company uses, the customer data in that TMS will be different from the customer data in the WMS, right. will be different from the transporter or the carrier data in the TMS between the TMS and the WMS. The material SKU or the products that you sell are different on the order management system compared to the warehouse management system. It's, and you're labeling them differently. Exactly, right? So and when you think about data, right? Yeah. And and you you were in the UK. Yeah. So I call a washcloth a flannel yeah. because I <laughs> I grew up with British parents, right? Yeah. But if your TMS is calling it a washcloth and your WMS is calling it a flannel, that is a recipe for disaster. Absolutely, right? And you know, if you're only selling one kind of flannel or one kind of washcloth, maybe right. you're still okay. Right. But Procter & Gamble sells thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of SKUs, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. For a single Gillette razor, for example, there are different, you know, package sizes. There are different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ways in which these SKUs are named. Customers are different. And think about, you know, the history of this, right? 20 years back, customers, suppliers, carriers, SKUs in your facilities, they were fairly static. Customers were close by, suppliers were close by, carriers right. were loyal, and God knows none of that is true today, especially in the last two <laughs> years, right? And the world is a drastically dynamic place today. Things are changing every day. And, you know, th there is this concept of a master data project that these companies often do. They do it once in 10 years, uh, whenever they have to do roll out a, a, a significantly new, fairly large transformation program, where they take 18 months to clean up their master data, right? Where wow. there are, you know, there's essentially labor and warm bodies wait, thrown. Wait a yeah. second. 
it's already not valid data by the time they finish that exactly. in 18 months, right? Exactly, right? Because wow. it's constantly you know, changing. So think about what that means for these, these businesses. Uh, you know, and, and what Pando essentially does before, well, anything else is Pando sets up the foundation, right? We have okay. what we call a network data platform. And the network data platform essentially is a single source of truth, a system of record that in real time keeps your data up to date across customers, suppliers, carriers, SKUs, and facilities in a way that this data can then be used by any one of these different business applications that you have. To in, and it's the same data. It's a central repository that you read from and write into. That's sort of your system of record for everything, right? That right. foundation, without that foundation, this whole hallelujah of, of, of you know, end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and optimization is all just words you know, on, on, on a presentation. It will never be realized on ground, right? And that's what companies are realizing, that you know, without that foundation of data being solved, nothing else is going to be possible. And right. now that Pando is solving with that foundation, that data problem, we're then able to solve a whole bunch of problems, you know, uh, with, with, and there are problems galore, most of which we saw during the pandemic, end-to-end -end supply chain, you know, freight visibility of costs, for example, right. companies did not have because costs were, you know, wildly fluctuating. There was no single repository of documentation because you're, in your order management system, you had a different set of documents in your transport management system that didn't translate very well into your warehouse management system. That wouldn't look, you know, right. that would look different. Um, dispatch no. planning, right? And all of these things. So there's a whole bunch of these problems that you can solve once you lay that foundation that's airtight. And that's essentially yeah. what Pando sets out to do. And no wonder people are still using spreadsheets to kind of connect the technology, which really is not a good plan at all. But you have a number of different solutions and products, and I don't think we'll be able to explore all of them in detail. But let's dive into a few key areas. We've mm -hmm. just talked about challenges. So let's talk about your control tower capabilities, because I think one of the biggest things that has come out of our learnings around the pandemic is that we really needed to be much better equipped to predict and control some of those supply chain disruptions, right? So talk us through that. How does it work? What are the benefits? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a great segue from the Network Data Foundation, right? So uh, you pointed out, Sarah, that, um, you know, by the time an 18-month master data project is over, yeah. that data is already out of date, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is that network data has got to be a living, breathing entity. It cannot be something that, you know, you do once and then that's going to sustain right. you for the for eternity, right? And so uh, what Pando essentially does is it creates this foundation of network data and then we embed ourselves in the transaction flow of transportation and warehousing and inventory and order management across the board. And so that data, the foundational data, you're able to answer questions like, you know, if a customer's order and what is called an OTIF percentage, which is an on-time yeah. in full percentage for customers, if that is not hit, is that because my warehouse employee did not ship enough? Is that because my carrier did not place a truck on time? Is that because the delivery was not on time or in full? Mm -hmm. Or was that because of weather disruptions? Or was that because inventory was not there across? Or was it because the customer generally would order, you know, 10 tons every day? versus suddenly has upped that number to 24 tons yesterday, for instance, right. right? Now, there's no single place where you can actually get all of this information. And if you look at this, let's, you know, just visually imagine this as siloed, you know, systems, and then you patch it up on top with a single quote unquote control tower, right? Yeah. Each of these systems have different sets of data. And so none of that, when you when it all comes up, there is washcloth on one and you know, flannel yes. on the other, and mm -hmm. that doesn't add up. Versus you turn that upside down, right? You don't put the control tower on top, but you put the control tower at the bottom. It's the foundational layer of data mm -hmm. that then feeds into these systems 
that then comes out in the same formats and you call, well, washcloths, wash, washcloths. Yeah. And you call C.H. Robinson, C.H. Robinson. And you call, uh, you know, uh, Charles, Charles. And, and so you know whether it's, the, it's a washcloth problem or a Charles problem or a C.H. Robinson problem because the input is controlled, right? So uh, with Pando, you're not only able to sort of solve that data problem, but you're able to predict and preempt a lot of these challenges, right? And you're able to do that better because the foundation is clean. Without that foundation, you're not going to be able to do it more effectively, right? And so we use a whole bunch of AI and, and predictive tools to essentially come up with a bunch of these, these predictions, but you're essentially able to get a comprehensive view across the end-to-end -end supply chain. Thank you for painting that picture. It's always so important um, because everybody has a level of technology understanding that's very different. And so to be able to paint that picture and really get a clear understanding of what that particularly looks like. But I think the audience is probably sitting there going, hallelujah, yeah, that there's something <laughs> out there <laughs> that does it differently and like uses the data in a way that's really, really gonna solve for that visibility. But you just mentioned AI. Right, and we just talked about uh, prediction and analyzing, which means it's also invaluable for that optimization piece. And yeah. so in TMS solution, you use AI to balance that, myth, that mix of cost, load, root, and SLA, which is incredible. And just something that a person with a clipboard or spreadsheets like we mentioned before, isn't gonna be able to do effectively. So talk, us, talk to us about that and the power of effective load planning. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll go back to uh, to to uh, the uh, power of having a common data layer, right? And it's not load planning or route planning. It's essentially dispatch planning, right? The ability to serve a customer's order in a way that you can serve them on time and in full, and and the rest of the supply chain doesn't matter if it's transport or warehousing or inventory or whatever else needs to all fall in place to do that effectively, right? So, you know, what is the dispatch plan planning problem first of all? It is which customer's orders do I need to serve, which is in your order management system, right? Yeah. From which DCs that have this inventory, which is in your warehouse or inventory management system, right? Through which carriers who at the right service level and cost will serve these customers, which is generally in your transport management system. Yeah. And do these carriers then have the capacity and the ability to serve these customers today which is generally in the systems of those carriers, which are external to your company, C.H. Robinson yeah. systems or Flexport systems and so on, right? Now, these are all disconnected systems today, right? And what I need to do um, as a DC manager in Atlanta, let's call him Rob, what Rob's got to do is essentially figure out from four completely disconnected places what the optimal plan is in a dynamic fashion, right? And yeah. that, of course, includes load planning and route planning and cost and service level optimization, but first of all, it's got to have a connective tissue, so to speak, right? Uh, right? Which essentially brings data from four completely disconnected systems. And that synapse that then tells me, this is all the data that you need to make that decision. And here's the optimization. And the outcome is, well, boom, you need five carriers to give you seven trucks, uh, some of which will go by air, some of which by rail, some of which by road. And you will hit your service level, which is 10 to 10.30 p.m. tonight or 10 to 10.30 a.m. tomorrow. And you'll hit it under budget in five out of those huh. six and above budget in the sixth one. And you can decide whether you want to go ahead with the sixth or not. Right? And that entire optimization for Pando is possible because of that data layer. Right? That data layer that connects all of these different systems, that synapse that's able to understand and yeah. interpret what's going on in all of these systems, and then also optimize and give you the decision itself. That's the dispatch planning problem. I love that. You're bringing everything into one place and kind of making the decision for them, really, based mm -hmm. on the data that you're able to collect, which, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of times you're trying to collect all of that from all of these different people. And if you can have that in one dashboard and even options, right? Here's your first option. Here's your second option. Here's your third option. Pick one, I think would really help a lot of individuals, a lot of supply chain professionals and drive that efficiency that we were talking about earlier. And I think, you know, in doing the research for this episode, you believe in enabling the logistics organizations with new age tech to drive business impact and scale. 
So talk about how important it is for organizations to refresh and upgrade on legacy technology platforms to drive the business impact. And how do you work with, like this is the integration piece, right? Because a lot of times when we're listening to uh, the technology that's out there, the question in the back of our mind is how do they integrate? And you talk about how you do integrate, but you don't really talk about how you do that. So how do you work with partners like Accenture, TCS, Microsoft, CH Robinson in enabling this digital transformation journey? Yeah. So two questions there. One, you know, how should companies think about their transformation? And two, how do we work with partners across the board, right? Uh, Fortunately for us, we don't have to go to customers and tell them to start thinking about this transformation. Uh, right. I think the last five <laughs> years did that for us, right? Um, you know, and I, I don't think it's just COVID, to be honest. Of course, COVID might have, you know, the pandemic catal catalyzed some part of this. Um, but I think it's it's more macro, right? Uh, it is it is labor costs. It's e-commerce. It's consumer preferences. You and I, my wife tells me, I order too much and too frequently and in smaller portions. Uh, and I think that's true for businesses as a whole, right? Uh, when we went to Danaher, they basically said their customers, which were businesses, were ordering in higher frequencies and in lower order quantities, right? And that yeah. sounded... Well, like my wife telling me that I was ordering too much and too frequently, right? And all of those consumer preferences and business preferences, which are fundamental macro shifts, uh, including, you know, freight costs and, you know, diesel costs and fuel costs, um, globalization, make in America, make in India, make in China, the China plus one strategy, global supply base, global customer base, all of these things are driving uh, you know, companies to sit up and take note of their supply chains. The Wall Street Journal in the last month carried three articles all three spoke about a new a, a, you know fortune 100 company appointing a new supply chain leader or a new cio right two were supply chain leader appointments and one was a cio appointment and the fascinating thing was that both cio appointments were people who were earlier supply chain leaders in those wow. companies and the supply chain leader appointment was a cio in the same company before that Right. And you're seeing these worlds come clashing together because companies are fairly mature when it comes to their marketing tech and their sales tech uh, and, and, you know, customer facing tech. And they're now realizing that what was called back end operations is now coming front and center of their global strategies. Right. So uh, we don't have to come to companies big or small and tell them why they've got to start thinking about this. Uh, we have companies coming to us and saying, look, I know what I want. I'm just not able to find that in the market. Right. So I'm patching that up with a whole bunch of my own solutions that I'm building or getting partners in the market to build, et cetera. So can you help solve this for me? Right. And so that's the first part of this question. I think the kind of phenomenal talent uh, that we are seeing and leadership and vision that we're seeing among supply chain professionals, especially in the manufacturing domain and the retail domain today, and not just in North America, but globally, I think is formidable. And I don't think we have to go preach to them. They lead us in terms of where right. we need to go. The second part of this question is the partner ecosystem, right? Now, there are two or three kinds of partners, right? The first is within the enterprise, there are you know transport management systems and warehouse management systems and ERPs and so on. And our belief is that these systems will not get completely replaced over time, right? Because they have a role and these are fairly entrenched systems of record, um, yeah. but they need an upgrade, right? And it's important. And we saw this happening with CRM, for example, right? You saw, um, you saw Salesforce getting augmented with a bunch of new age technology, right? Similarly, yeah. you saw this happening in the HRMS space. You saw Workday getting augmented with a bunch of new technology. Marketing. And I think marketing they're marketing. And Absolutely, right? Yeah, marketing and CRM coming together, HRM getting upgraded and so on. And I think the same will happen with supply chain too and is happening with supply chain too. So I think that it's important for us to deeply integrate with and be proactive about integrations with these, uh, you know, enterprise, legacy enterprise technology players right? like yeah. SAP and Oracle and JDA and Manhattan and E2Open and the likes, right? They are disincentivized to integrate between each other. Pando is incentivized to integrate with all of them. So right. we proactively go integrate with all of them and make it super easy for us to integrate with all of them. That's one piece, right? The second set of partners are the network partners, the customers, the suppliers, the carriers, et cetera, right? Um, and we proactively integrate with them. We don't wait for customers to integrate with them. We are integrated with over 5,000 such partners, and we continue to integrate with those partners as well. 
And the third set of partners are others in the market who are going and saying the same story, right? They're going to customers and saying, hey guys, you gotta go on this, jump on this bandwagon and you gotta, you gotta take note of this, this uh, the new tech that's coming up in the supply chain space. You've got to unify your supply chain experience. You've got to consolidate your supply chain experience and so on. Uh, and these are the service partners or the or the or the uh, integrators in the market, right? Folks like um, you know Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, TCS, um, and so on, which are partners that have deep relationships with Pando, and we essentially go to customers together um, and and onboard customers together in a way that you know they they help us penetrate these customers deeper, and together we're able to you know better deliver the services and the value that we set out to deliver. Well, I love that because I always say that collaboration is the future of business and Absolutely. you've just proven me right once uh -huh. again. Well, another issue that's close to my heart is sustainability. And so far, your network has helped to reduce uh, 2,165 tons of CO2. How have you done that? How does your platform facilitate a reduction in carbon footprint? And then, you know, with a growing focus on sustainability, do you find that your clients are sort of expecting their suppliers to be an active part of helping them achieve their ESG goals. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, that number is just this quarter, um, and it's, it's not just a, this quarter. Of course, well done. Uh, and <laughs> and it's uh, uh, you know we serve we serve uh, large and medium sized businesses globally, and uh, uh, you know they, they have fairly large. Uh, both both technology footprints and distribution footprints, and so the ability yeah. to sort of serve, uh, you know, save their their carbon footprint uh, uh, framework is fairly significant. So, uh, two parts, right? One, it's important, and companies are realizing that today, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think during COVID, you saw share price correlation with you know ESG compliance and uh, you know CO two footprint reductions and so on. You're also seeing companies proactively go. Uh, promise to the market, both their customer market and their investor market, the shareholder market, which largely is the same for most of these companies, that they will be, uh, you know, carbon neutral by 2025, 2030, 2035, yeah. and so on, right? Big uh, goals. Yeah, and you know, I I think the important piece is that manufacturing broadly is, you know, the energy used in manufacturing is more and more becoming easier for it to be renewable. Right. Uh, and companies within the manufacturing footprint of both their suppliers as well as, you know, their own facilities are becoming more and more carbon neutral and they see a okay. path to getting there. I think in their supply chains, however, which is, you know, whether it's their warehouses or it is their transportation footprints or the way their suppliers are procuring and supplying goods, etc. Across their supply chains, I think there is less clarity uh, or a less a clear path to uh, you know, a, a carbon neutral environment, right? And mostly because, you know, I, I remember back in the day when we were starting out, um, the head of supply chain for Unilever would say, you know, what do you think we're transporting in all of our trucks? And we said, I, I guess Unilever products. He said, no, diesel. We That's all we move because for every dollar that we spend, 75 cents is is just diesel. And so right. there is there is that that whole sort of you know idea that you're essentially moving uh, you know freight, but actually you're spending on on fuel that is not particularly sustainable. So with Pando, I think the ability to look across your supply chain and get end-to-end -end visibility is not just end-to-end -end visibility of costs or service levels, but we look at carbon footprint or or um, you know the the overall sustainability angle as an important third. Right pillar uh, that sustains yeah. these, right? That could be uh, bettered through, you know, scorecarding of your suppliers, scorecarding of your SKUs, looking at what the true cost of carbon, uh, you know, at an SKU level is, at a particular lane level is, that might result in moving your warehouses uh, and having better networks that are better planned. It might mean, you know, uh, delisting certain suppliers or certain certain carriers because they are not carbon compliant, uh, and so on. And we're able to give that scorecard more comprehensively to our customers. Awesome! I love that sustainability's got to be at the forefront of everybody's business, and partnering with companies like Pando can really help you do that. Hey, so I, I'm, now... I'm sorry to interrupt. I love what one customer said, which is Castrol, yeah. BP Castrol, right? Said. Yeah. You know, sustainability is the new digital, and that's why we're going for Pando, right? They said, look, you know, we we want to digitize not because we want to be digital, but because we want to be sustainable is why we're digitizing, right? Which I thought was phenomenal. 
I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Now, one of the biggest questions that we get when um, supply chain professionals are listening to these um, interviews and thinking about, you know, how much they love what you're saying and how they would love to work with you is really the onboarding, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of scary. You know, it might take a long time. Can you walk us through that? How yeah. does the onboarding sort of work when they come to Pando and, and really say to you, we want to implement your technology? Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, you know, to when you buy everything that Pando offers, uh, the time to value, not the time to go live, not the time to onboard, not the time to integrate, but the time to value that we promise is 90 days. And okay. that's that's a game changer, right? It's the gold standard when it comes to enterprise technology. We have never heard another company put money on the table and say, we'll be able to deliver in 90 days. Now, but we don't think that's enough. Uh, internally within Pando, our customer success team has taken up an OKR this year to bring us to 45 days from night wow. half the time to going live. And I'm happy to say a Fortune 500 business that picked Pando's TMS and WMS was able to go live across the entire region in 45 days last quarter. Wow. Right? And wow. it's never, they went on record publicly to say that this is the fastest implementation that they have ever seen. And they believe is the fastest implementation in the industry when it comes to the CPG okay. business, right? So yeah. our belief, and I'll just sort of touch upon how we're able to do that, right? Our belief is that ultimately technology is useful only and only when it delivers value. You shouldn't be paying for time and money, uh, time and effort, right? You should be paying for value and not for time and effort. And so the way we sort of structured this is to make Pando not just easy to use, but easy to buy, easy to try, easy to onboard, and easy to use, right? And that's important. And the way you sort of think about, you spoke about integrations, you spoke about, you know, the data layer, right? Uh, if if uh, you were to buy another TMS in the market or WMS in the market, they'd say, go fix your data first and then come to us, right? right. Or we're going to help you fix that data, but we don't know how long it's going to take. But so with Pando, we said, it's our job, right? It's the reason you're buying Pando and we'll get you up and running in 45 to 90 days. Uh, so I think it's a combination of the ability to integrate freely, uh, the ability to integrate proactively, the ability to look at data and be able to consume that data more comprehensively, and our ability to be modular. You don't have to boil the ocean when you think about Pando. You can start right. small. You can start with one function, with you know one particular module. You can look at just freight procurement or just warehouse picking or packing or just you know we spoke about dispatch planning, etc. Yeah. Um, and you can look at this only for you know one business unit or one geography, right? No pressure to do this across across uh, the world or across the country, but. You know, most customers love what they see and they consistently expand and it's easy to expand. Once you set up that foundation, you can then pick yeah. and choose what you want and you're able to quickly expand across the board, right? So that's how we think about onboarding. Great. And then another question, you know, I'm sitting in the audience, love what you're saying. Who do I have to be to be an ideal client for you where I'm picking up the phone and giving you a call? Yeah, um, great question. Um, Today, Pando serves manufacturers and retailers, right? So we don't serve logistics companies. We don't, don't serve uh, e-commerce businesses, but we serve traditional manufacturers and retailers, right? Um, if you've got SAP, Oracle, Manhattan, um, JDA, or PeopleSoft, um, you know, or, or any such ERP that is that you've been using for well, that's been around for 20 plus years. Um, and you have a global supply chain um, or a local distribution footprint that is multi-tiered. You have factories, you have warehouses, you have distribution centers, and you, sub you, you uh, deliver to retail and consumer and, and, and multiple channels. If you are a CPG company, a chemicals business, a pharma business, a bulk commodities business, an automotive business, uh, anything in manufacturing or retail, really. And if you're not the $500 million in revenue, up to, well, $50 billion in revenue, right. um, we're able to serve you as well. Uh, the minute it sort of crosses these thresholds, if you're an e-commerce business or you're a hundred million dollar business, um, or you know you uh, you don't have your ERP in place, uh, Pando would not be able to serve you very well right now. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that because it's always important that we match 
the right companies with the right providers as well. And now it's time for the case study, which is one of my absolute favorite questions. And I know that quantifiable ROI is key for you at Pando. So can you give us an example of how you've worked with one of your customers? What was the challenge that they came to you with? Which of your solutions were they working with? And what was the impact or ROI of that solution? Absolutely. I'll talk about two in parallel, uh, just to contrast. One is Johnson & Johnson. The, of course, all of us know Johnson & Johnson, CPG Business, Fortune 10. Um, and the other is Danaher, also Fortune 500. It's a chemicals business. Um, J&J came to us uh, at the peak of the pandemic saying they want to reduce their overall supply chain costs. And they want to get end-to-end -end visibility and optimization across their, their supply chain. Uh, we essentially went live in under 90 days. Uh, we returned their, the amount they had invested in us uh, in the next 90 days. And wow. over the course of the third 90 days, we returned eight times what they had invested in us uh, in quantifiable ROI that they audited. Right. Wow. Uh, and then they went public and, well, became uh, the voice for Pendo. And they're very happy customers across. They've been using our transport and warehousing management capabilities. And I want to you know, specify that they were able to achieve those kinds of results simply and only because they laid the foundation right. They used Pando's network data platform. They were able to consolidate all of their data in one place. And then they built on top of that data to be able to sort of get, get to the kind of results they wanted. On the other hand, just to draw a contrast, while uh, this CPG business, Johnson & Johnson, wanted to reduce costs, on the other hand, Danaher wanted to increase their top line. Right? They essentially came to Pando at the peak of the pandemic saying, our order book is full. Our inventory levels are able to sustain that order book. But our shipping efficiency is awful, which means that our warehouse processing and shipping efficiency is awful, which means right. that I'm not able to actually realize the bookings or the order book in terms of revenue, right? Because I'm not right. able to ship fast enough. In actual dollar terms, you know, without, without getting into real numbers, they were essentially saying, for instance, you know, I have $5 million worth of orders and I have $5 million worth of inventory, but I'm able to realize only $2.5 million worth of revenue because I'm not able to ship out fast enough and deliver fast enough. So it was a customer service and revenue problem. And they were essentially saying, look, the only, I, you know, I charge my customers for freight, but I just need to bring more efficiency across my supply chain. The minute the order hits the books, the warehousing, the transportation, all of that needs to work like clockwork, and I need to push out and deliver as quickly as possible, right? Uh, we were able to, again, uh, go live in, in a quarter. Uh, and within the second quarter, uh, Danher was able to achieve uh, uh, you know, the, the 2.5 million of additional revenue recognition that they wanted to achieve. They've now started expanding with Pando into other geographies and other, other uh, business units um, and are a very happy customer of Pando's as well. Amazing stories. I, this is why it's my favorite part of the episode is really yeah. just hearing what they've been able to achieve and what they've been able to do. So what does the future look like for Pando? Oh, we're very excited about the future, Sarah. Um, and more than more than the future, we're excited about today. Uh, I think the most exciting thing for us, me and my team, is the ability to get a ringside view into such great businesses getting built in the market, right? Market leaders, the brands that we love, as I said, and helping those brands serve us better. Um, and I think that's been very exciting. Um, we are today present in North America and Asia. Both markets are growing rapidly for Pando. We'll continue staying focused on those markets. Uh, we also have, through our partners, a presence in the Middle East, uh, in South America, and in, and in Europe. Uh, we'll continue to push uh, through partners into those markets um, as well. Um, I think today transportation and warehousing are broadly the two buckets of products that Pando has. Uh, I think we'll continue expanding that product uh, footprint to go across into order management, inventory, and the rest of the supply chain as well. Um, but overall, I think, uh, you know, the core focus of what we're doing today, which is to serve manufacturers and retailers and help them get end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and optimization. I think, you know, really the future for us is to continue doing what we're doing today just heads down, continue executing, and ensure that we get more very happy customers uh, who, can, who can talk about us the way we talk about, about them. 
So exciting. And I really, really enjoyed that conversation. What you're doing at Pando is really exciting. There's literally a solution to address every need your customer has. I mean, pulling in the day-to-day -day operations around planning, procurement, all the way to the strategic predictions and anal um, I have a really hard time with that word. Hold on a second. <laughs> all the way to the strategic predictions and analysis and the bigger benefits that come from visibility and collaboration. I really felt during our discussion that you very much have an eye on the wider industry. You're really in tune with that network globally and I'm excited to see how you're going to continue to grow and deliver better and better strategic solutions for supply chain. If you want to find out more, you can check them out at pando.ai. And a massive thanks to Nitin for joining me today and to the team at Pando for making this episode happen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Sarah.